So, uh, now this work is joined with Michael Goldman, uh, who is not here, I hope. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> no. no, because he was also delivering a, a, a mini course on this. So I'll try to not to spoil too much uh, and focus on a simple case and give you some ideas about uh, the result we obtained in this concave uh, random assignment problem. So this is the, the plan. Uh, so let's move to, uh, uh, well, okay, because this goes, f uh, okay, so what is the assignment problem? Uh, there's been already a talk uh, mentioning uh, something very much related uh, to the, uh, which is the optimal transport problem, but we can state it uh, like a combinatorial optimization problem, and in fact, uh, as such, uh, it is studied uh, in, in a, also from combinatorial, uh, uh, with combinatorial tools. So uh, what do we have? We have, uh, say, a set of workers uh, to be assigned uh, to jobs, uh, a set of uh, producers that want to meet uh, sellers, uh, so they want to assign uh, some, uh, for example, if you are workers to job, uh, you're, you're, say, you are planning everything, you want to say, okay, worker I, you go to work uh, to position J, and you do your job. So in abstract uh, formulation, we have two sets, uh, which you can think of set of points. Uh, okay, it's here x i and the y j, you can think of them as points, actually they will be points on the line for us because we are working in a simple one dimensional setting. Then you have the assignment which is just a permutation which is a rule. Okay, let me be precise. Here we have the two sets and they have the same uh, uh, number, okay, so number of uh, elements. Um, because of course uh, otherwise you should be careful of what you do if you have two jobs uh, rather or you have too, too, ma too many workers and uh, uh, less jobs. But let's assume that they are in the same number. So they, we have a total cost uh, which is given, if you want, uh, by the sum over all the workers uh, of what? Of the cost of, uh, okay, for the, let's say, the amount of money you need to pay worker uh, uh, at position xi to do the job at position uh, sigma uh, i, okay? So, of course, you want to optimize and uh, you run uh, um, uh, an uh, a, discrete, uh, com a discrete variational problem by minimizing over all the possible permutations, okay? All the workers are equivalent uh, from each other. We don't distinguish uh, between workers and so on. So uh, the, the cost, uh, the actual cost will be the minimum over all the possible permutations of this type of sums. Well, in principle, C could be very abstract, but uh, uh, in our case, uh, we're going to restrict it uh, to a specific uh, kind of cost, which is a, a function, uh, let me write it uh, again as C, but a function of the distance uh, uh, between the two points, uh, X and Y. Of course, we need now to think of points uh, being actually in some space, uh, in a metric space, uh, but they will be on the line, okay, with the Euclidean distance, but then we modify the distance uh, with this function C. So say that this function is monotonically increasing, uh, okay, uh, and now here you, you can see that something interesting happens because if you have a function C which is convex, think for example of uh, C of X to be X squared, okay, this uh, favors uh, monotone assignments. Okay, now we'll show you in some pictures what I mean by this. And instead it is known that if you take a, con a function which is concave instead, say X uh, square root of X for example, square root of the distance, well, you have a much richer structure and uh, things become uh, more, interesting, uh, more interesting and you can also, say, give some interpretations of this type of uh, hierarchies of, uh, uh, so the solutions, uh, the optimal uh, assignments uh, exhibit some sort of local uh, structures uh, and you can provide some sort of economic interpretation of this. So there's a nice uh, paper by McCann already in the late 90s uh, where he pushes uh, a bit uh, I mean, <coughs> he says we should focus more on the concave case, uh, and uh, this is what we try to do with, uh, with Michael in this case. So let's see some simulations. Uh, uh, what I mean by simulations, uh, uh, numerical uh, solutions. So for example, here I take uh, 25 uh, points, uh, uh, which are the workers, let's put them in red, okay? And then these are already in the line. I mean, the setting we're going to study, these are points in the line. So let me take some random points uh, in the line, just to say, okay, these are where the workers live, the blue one, and then other red points, which are where the jobs uh, need to be done. And of course, now the, the price uh, to pay is the distance uh, to the power alpha. And let's see what happens when alpha is larger than one, so we are in the con convex case, or smaller than one in the concave case. Okay, now this is alpha equal to one, and uh, the solution, 
Okay, it's numerically computed and uh, this uh, big circle is just to show that uh, this, uh, say, worker here, we follow where it's going to work, it's going to uh, do the job at position here, okay? Since we are in one dimension, this is a way to represent uh, the solution. You could also plot the red points on top and blue points on bottom and show the connections, but now this, this type of graph is going to show some interesting feature that actually we're not going to explore it uh, in this talk, but uh, uh, let's see what happens. So already we see that if we change alpha, the solution changes, okay? You have this much larger uh, uh, matchings, uh, these assignments, which are much farther. So this uh, poor uh, worker here must go up to almost to the other side of the, of the town to work. But also we see something interesting, that there are some, uh, uh, say, local uh, situations here, for example, right? Uh, we have a sort of an island of workers and jobs, also here, here, also here, right? Well, this uh, happens uh, essentially because uh, you can show, you can prove that with, with this type of cost, an optimal solution ca cannot cross. Essentially, there are no crossings between these green lines, okay? It is uh, the so-called uh, no crossing property. And uh, this, uh, okay, you see instead that, that for alpha equal one, we have some crossing, for example, this one, right? And this one. Okay, this is numerically uh, computed, so you should not trust uh, exactly the alpha equal to one because uh, uh, it's really where the, there's a phase transition. But as long as alpha is strictly uh, concave, so uh, between uh, zero and one, but strictly, you have this non-crossing property. And you see, indeed, you see also for 0 0.4, 0 0.6, uh, you see, but the solution changes, okay? It's not uh, so rigid as it, as it seems. So you see from 0 0.9 to 0 0.99, you get uh, still the non-crossing property, but the, the, the islands, uh, if you want, these uh, regions uh, are, uh, uh, still visible, but uh, uh, different, okay? And now what alpha equals to one, or if you want is larger than one, slightly larger, you get some completely different situation, and uh, it stabilizes, okay? I'm running alpha to two, three, you see it's always the same, okay? This is because in one dimension, if you take a convex uh, uh, cost, uh, the situation becomes uh, very boring. You have exactly the monotone uh, matching, uh, the one induced, if you want, by the quantile uh, transform. That was mentioned in some, some in the first talk, right? So this is why we focus on the concave case because we have a richer structure. We want to say something uh, possibly new. Now, of course, this is a very uh, wide uh, theory, a wide problem, uh, and uh, you can treat it from the analysis point of view. Uh, but if you in, if you put some probability, it becomes a bit nicer. Also, because the talk, the, the, the workshop is uh, PD and probability, so. Uh, where probability enters, essentially we want to study random instances of the problem. In this case, for example, we fixed the, the random positions of the houses and the, and the jobs, uh, right, and the working places, and then we solve, for a specific instance, we solve the, the combinatorial optimization problem. So this gives you a random, a random variable, which is the cost, the overall cost, but also a random variable, which is the solution, I mean, this, this uh, green lines, uh, if you change uh, randomly the points uh, here, if you sample randomly the points, uh, they will change. So this will define some random variables in a, an appropriate space. So if you want to study these combinatorial optimization problems uh, from a random, uh, so uh, from a stochastic probabilistic perspective, uh, well, actually it's a very old theory, starting, starting from this seminal paper by uh, Birdwood, uh, Ham, uh, Hammersley, and uh, I forgot the third one, okay. Um, but it's still uh, from the late uh, 50s, right? And actually they didn't study this uh, matching problem, but uh, a more complicated problem, which is the traveling salesperson problem, okay? Where you have uh, cities to be connected by a path with minimal length. So uh, this gave uh, rise to a, a whole theory, which is called uh, sometimes uh, additive Euclidean functional theory, but it can have also other names, okay? This, this is perhaps the most uh, important uh, type of tools that you, you can use. Uh, and the focus is, uh, of course, uh, not for a, on a specific uh, uh, small scale instance of the problem. Even if it is random, you can sample 25 points and 25 points, but your interest is, is uh, in the scaling limits, okay? What happens if you have uh, hundreds, uh, thousands of points uh, when we have millions of points? And these are randomly sampled according to some uh, nice rule, right? 
of course, uh, you can prove a lot of results. Uh, uh, but recently, uh, there's been a bit of development uh, in, uh, in so-called bipartite problems, like the assignment problem, where, where you have uh, red points uh, given, for example, by, by the position of the workers, and blue points uh, for the houses. So if you have a bipartite problem, I mean, your, uh, your, your set of random points is already divided into two subsets. Uh, uh, like the assignment problem, so the techniques, uh, the classical techniques uh, fail in some cases, uh, so you need a more precise uh, analysis. Why? Because uh, if you have red and blue points uh, in a region of the space, uh, well, the total number of red and blue points uh, will have some fluctuation in any subregion. If you fix a subregion, you are sampling uh, random red points, you will see a, a random number of red points, but also you are independently sampling blue points. This is the, the key assumption. These are red and blue points, but sampled independently of each other. And so you, have, you will have small fluctuations of the number of points, uh, and this gives you larger costs. That, for example, in the non-bipartite problem, which is uh, the case where we don't distinguish essentially between workers and jobs, uh, but uh, this, okay, you have to give a different interpretation of this. So in this type of problems, like the assignment problem, you have larger costs in general, but also larger fluctuations that make the, the analysis a bit more difficult. So classically, the, the first example was given by of unexpected cost asymptotics. Now we we'll tell you a bit more about in the, in the concave case on the line. The, the first example is this classical paper by Aitaj, Komlos, and Tuznadi in the 80s. And now recently, starting from a statistical physics uh, perspective, uh, we've been working a lot. Uh, and Michael will uh, give a more precise uh, say description of all, what, what, of all the recent uh, developments. Now, in this, paper, in this uh, paper with Michael and in this talk, we're going to focus on the line. And on the line, uh, somehow, the results are known, but maybe not so known. Uh, so, so part of these results, the, these results may be also folklore. Uh, if you discuss with physicists, uh, they say, okay, it's trivial, we already did everything, but <laughs> of course, uh, uh, from a mathematical point of view, we need some, to put some details. So let's see what happens on the line. And okay, we want to study random uh, uh, instances of the problem. So as I told you now, with the small x, uh, the position of the workers, and small y, become big x and big y, because these are random variables. So we sample, if you want, we sample n, uh, uh, red points and blue points, well, according to which rule? Well, so let's say that we take uh, IID, so independent uh, red and blue points are all independent, also the red points are independent of each other, and identically distributed. Well, this assumption of identically distributed means they have all the same low, and of course you may say, but what happens if the red points uh, have some low and the blue points have a different low? Well, in that case, things are a bit simpler for the type of questions that we are asking, okay? So let's assume that the red points and blue points have all the same low, but these are independent. And then there's a cost. We take the distance, the Euclidean distance, but then we, we turn it into a different distance. We take a cost, which is okay, a, a concave, uh, uh, power of the distance. So if you want, this is still a distance because if you take a distance, you take a distance to the power alpha with alpha smaller than one, it's still a distance, but it's not uh, anymore the U Euclidean distance. And as I told you, the, the random variable, which depends on the position of the points, uh, so because first you sample the points and then you solve the combinatorial op optimization problem, well, let's write it as m alpha, like the matching uh, with cost alpha, which depends on the position of the points, uh, is simply this, okay, as I told you, you minimize over all the permutations. Right, so what is the heuristics? Uh, the heuristics, uh, well, the <laughs> heuristics after uh, reading a lot of <laughs> papers on this stuff, uh, is that uh, if you have uh, n points uh, and these are on a line, you will expect uh, to have distance which is like one over n, right? So if you have n points, uh, so these, these are uniform on the unit interval, right? You have to sample n points. Okay, they will not be precisely on a grid, uh, but you expect something like this. Uh, so you expect the typical distance between one over n. Also for the blue points, maybe they will not exactly the same position, but you expect like this. So the typical distance uh, between a red point and a blue point, you look for the closest point, it should be one over n. So since we're taking the distance to the power uh, alpha, you expect a cost for uh, a single of this term to be 1 over n to the power alpha. We have n of them, so the heuristics uh, should be that the cost scales as n uh, to the power 1 minus alpha. 
and uh, as I told you, but there are fluctuations. So somehow there's also the heuristics due to say central limit theorem. You say, okay, but there is some central limit theorem going on. So we expect uh, that there should be some barrier at uh, uh, one half because this is the typical scaling of uh, the central limit theorem. So if you want a, a refined heuristic is that for the alpha larger than one half, uh, there are some these fluctuations of the red and blue points uh, and this dominate, so you get a scaling uh, of a square root of n, okay? And actually what we prove uh, with Michael is that uh, as alpha is between one and uh, zero and one half, uh, you, you can renormalize the cost by this power and you get almost sure convergence. And uh, if uh, alpha is larger, we have a convergence in low if you renormalize with this uh, square root of n, okay? And okay, there are some new ideas uh, in both cases, uh, but uh, let me focus on the uh, alpha larger than one half case. And the possibly new idea is that, okay, we have a, a problem for every n, which we can think as a combinatorial optimization problem, but also as an optimal transport problem, as we tell you. And uh, what is the, the optimal transport problem? Well, uh, for the optimal transport problem, you have two um, probability measures uh, that you need to transport one into each other. Well, what we do is, actually is to generalize, to relax uh, this condition of having two probability measures, uh, and instead uh, do a transport problem where the difference between the two measures uh, becomes a Brownian bridge. And the Brownian bridge uh, is a sort of Brownian motion conditioned to be zero uh, at uh, say at time one, for example. So this Brownian bridge is not of total variation. So you cannot recover the two uh, red and blue points, but we can uh, still give a meaning to the limit problem. And this gives you a notion of, uh, a good notion for the limit. And actually to give a, no a notion uh, to the limit, we need to use a bit of Young integration. So which is a nice, a nice tool that I like a lot. So, okay, if you really want to have a, a synthesis of what we do is this, okay, we, we show convergence as n grows uh, in two different regimes. Uh, and of course, what happens uh, uh, with alpha equal one alpha is very interesting because we, we don't know what happens essentially. Uh, we, okay, we have upper and lower bounds. We know what is the correct rate, which is neither this nor this, but we, we don't have a precise result like this. So if you want really have, uh, an open problem in dimension one is to study this quantity with alpha equals one half. Anyway, let's go to uh, a more classical uh, uh, approach uh, by now, which is uh, not the one we employed with, uh, with Michael. And since I don't want to spoiler too much, uh, but I want to give you a, a, a small uh, introduction to this PDE technique. Also because otherwise there will, well, there will be no PDEs in my talk. So. Okay, so as already mentioned uh, in the first talk, right, uh, there is a notion of uh, uh, optimal transport and related uh, distance, which is called uh, the Wasserstein distance. But uh, to define this Wasserstein distance, you need uh, two measures, uh, which replace the, the red points and the blue points, uh, but they become also continuous measures if you want. But if these are atomic measures, uh, we're going to see what happens. And uh, on the same space, let's say that you have a space with a distance uh, and we require to have the same mass. Okay, you can think of them of two probability measures, but also two measures of, the important thing is that they have the same mass. And also you need to require uh, to have a finite moments of the correct order. And then given this, you can define this uh, optimal transport cost of order alpha. Now, still you are minimizing, but you're not minimizing over permutations. Uh, you are relaxing the notion of uh, assignment into what is called a transport plan or a coupling. And then, but the, this cost is, looks very similar, right? Because you're doing a sum, which becomes an integral, the distance to the power alpha, and then uh, over all the points, right? So what is pi? Pi, uh, let me write it here. So this set gamma of mu nu is just the set of, uh, uh, okay, of measures in this case, because uh, we don't have uh, uh, the, the, the condition to be probabilities, uh, so, so finite uh, positive measures uh, on the Borel subset or the mm, product uh, here sigma algebra, such that the first marginal, uh, so let me write it this way, the first marginal uh, on the first one is uh, mu and the second one is, uh, is mu, okay? So you are s sort of relaxing the notion of a function uh, which maps uh, mu into nu in something which is like a probabilistic uh, function, but still uh, it gives a sort of assignment, okay? A way to, to couple uh, the two source and target uh, measures, okay? 
Now, uh, what happens if alpha is smaller than one, actually already this definition gives you a distance uh, which is called the Wasserstein distance of older alpha. You can also call it a de Zolotarev distance apparently. But there are also Kantorovich would be a better name, but uh, Wasserstein is the, is the name uh, that, that usually it is given for this. If alpha is larger than one, you need to be a bit more careful. You need to take one over alpha, okay? Yeah. But anyway, what happens if our measures are uh, the empirical measures? So you take uh, these points uh, xi and the other points yj, and you do the measure, which is the sum of the deltas over the points. Well, you can prove uh, by Birkhoff theorem that uh, this uh, minimum over all these relaxed uh, transports uh, is actually uh, the same as the bipartite assignment uh, cost. Okay, so here, uh, what, what, is, what is the practical meaning of this? That here, instead of looking at uh, the, the permutations, you can look uh, to relaxations of the permutations, which will be, say, uh, sort of by, by stochastic matrices. Okay, this is why you need uh, some, some result uh, uh, or Birkhoff about the bistochastic matrices. Okay, so but this is the first link. So our combinatorial uh, problem becomes uh, more a problem of analysis. Okay, where on measure theory and analysis, calculus of variation. In principle, you can also allow for continuous uh, measures. Now, what happens uh, also is that you can get. Uh, so let me go back here. So this problem here now is an infimum over a set of a functional which you see is linear over pi. So you're formally minimizing something which is linear over pi, and this set you can check uh, is convex. Okay, so you are in the convex optimization uh, framework. While if you are working directly with the permutations, you don't have this uh, extra convexity structure. So it's a it's a integer programming problem which may be more difficult to solve. So now instead, this is a, a convex, if you want, it's a linear programming relaxation of the original problem, which does not change the cost. So you can use tools like uh, duality, and in this, in this setting, this is called the Kantorovich uh, duality. So what does it mean? It means that the minimum, uh, so the primal problem, called like this sometimes, is uh, the, the, a supremum over a different, so it's a different problem. It's still a maximization, uh, an optimization problem, and now it's a supremum. Or what? Well, you need to do some computations, but you get uh, this formula here. You get the integral over f over e, sorry, your space, uh, f integrated with respect to the difference between the two measures, okay? Which is simply the difference between the two integrals, okay? Integral of f in the mu minus integral of f in the nu. But uh, who are these f? Okay, not all the f's uh, are valid. You need to take functions which satisfy this constraint for every x and y. Uh, what does it mean? It means that f is uh, holder continuous with uh, exponent alpha and constant one. Okay, so let me also write this notation here just to, so you take a seminorm, uh, older seminorm of uh, exponent alpha and you require that this quantity when you maximize over f such that this is uh, smaller than one. Okay, so we take this for granted and see what happens. Okay, we, we use it uh, uh, for the uh, coupled with a PDE, okay? I want to write a slide using a PDE, otherwise uh, it's, um, so this is not uh, by us, it was done by Bobkov and Ledoux. And they gave a PDE for the approach to this uh, matching, uh, random matching problem. But you can also state it without uh, uh, probability here. So let's, let's take as a state uh, E, the unit interval, okay? And the distance, oh, okay, sorry. Distance is the distance uh, to the power alpha, okay? And alpha is between and one. So the recipe is like this. You solve uh, first uh, this uh, fractional, uh, fractional Poisson PD. Okay, let's forget a bit about the boundary conditions. You can also do it on the torus. Okay. Now you solve it, uh, you find say a potential uh, U, right? Uh, which solves uh, this uh, with a fractional Laplacian given by your alpha, which is the exponent here on the distance. Now you take a test function u in the dual formulation, right, which has this older seminorm smaller than one, and of course you can write uh, the integral uh, while well, replacing the right hand side here with, uh, with your uh, expression, right? Now, forget um, about the problem, these, these are maybe singular measures with respect to Lebesgue. Anyway, so let's formally replace this. Now, the integration is with respect to Lebesgue. And now this Laplacian is self adjoint, you can put it on the other side. So you can take the fractional Laplacian of F, sorry, there should be a bracket here, maybe it's cleaner, times U. And now they say, okay, let's, let's do computations in Fourier. 
And uh, this is where, where they got lost, because I, will, I wanted to, to show you some simple way to obtain it, but it's not so obvious. Now, of course, in Fourier, you can uh, say uh, this is an isometry. Maybe here there should be a, a conjugate here. But you can write uh, this uh, as, a, as a series, right? The Fourier series of what? Well, you have the Fourier coefficients of the fractional Laplacian of your f. But so if the fractional Laplacian is like taking a fractional derivative and f is a c alpha, well, one could expect that this quantity here is, uh, is bounded somehow, is, is tamed, uh, we can estimate it. And of course, uh, now, if you, this is uniformly estimated, uh, somehow there should be an upper bound which uses only the Fourier coefficients of u. Now, if you do the computations in the correct way, you can argue that uh, this quantity here, for every f uh, such that uh, uh, the holder seminorm is smaller than one, because this is our assumption, well, you get uh, an upper bound uh, of this type here, okay? which is a, is a Sobolev, is a fractional uh, Sobolev uh, norm of negative order, okay? So you get an abstract inequality and then you can pl plug it uh, in, uh, in our specific problem, okay? These things will, uh, will pop up uh, for sure in uh, Michael, uh, Michael's course, so don't worry if you don't get it. Anyway, for the moment we are, we are estimating, <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> So we're estimating uh, the, the optimal transport cost using a negative uh, Sobolev uh, norm, okay? So this is the key thing. And this is uh, fully, if you want, PDE harmonic analysis uh, argument. Now let's go back to our random problem. We take as a function the deltas, uh, the empirical measures uh, uh, for the red and blue points, uh, and now we need to, to plug in some probability. Essentially the idea is that, okay, th these have the same mass, uh, so the Fourier coefficient at zero is just the difference between the masses uh, disappears. But also for large k, you can estimate very easily by independence. This is a sum of independent variables. You can estimate it. And essentially, this is independent of k, because these are just IED points, and, but grows with n, with the number of points. So you can estimate it from above by n. So what you get, you get this. If you plug it naively, you get an expect, a stake expectation, of course. This is the first thing you should do as a as a probability, you say, uh, I have a quantity, a random variable, let's check the expectation. So the expectation is bounded from above by the expectation of the expression in the previous uh, slide, this expectation here. Use a bit of uh, uh, holder inequality, you get uh, the square root of n coming from here, because it was a square root, and this series here. Okay, this series, actually k is different than zero, because uh, for zero we had uh, this good bound. But of course, it, it converges uh, in some cases. So if alpha is larger than one half, uh, this series converges and you get square root of n. Now, if alpha is equal to one half or smaller, this will diverge. So I'm, I'm saying something false here, essentially. This will be plus infinity if alpha is smaller than one half. But you can plug in some, uh, some, some, some smoothing argument before and, and uh, you get um, a good estimate because this series diverges in a different way if alpha equals one alpha or alpha is smaller, right? Uh, so here they should be just smaller than one half. Of course, you know that if alpha equals one half, you have the harmonic series, so you get a logarithm divergence uh, and perhaps there's, all, there's also a square root here. Okay, sorry, there was a square root also of this series here. So what you get essentially, and this was proved correctly by Bobkov and Ledoux, you get a rate also for alpha equals one half and also for alpha, alpha smaller than one half. So this is very good, but we have only an upper bound and we don't know about the lower bounds and the limit, okay? So what we did instead with Michael is to characterize and describe the limits. So let me simplify the statement and take points which are IID with common law uh, supported on an interval, okay, a bounded interval. We can also treat, uh, some, in some cases, uh, unbounded uh, support, but uh, let's take them on an interval. And uh, let's see what happens if we can be more precise about what happens uh, in the limit. So call small f, uh, which is not a small f uh, as before, uh, is just the absolutely continuous part with respect to the bag of the, of the law, okay? The, you just do the decomposition of the law into absolutely continuous part, uh, and you take f and the other, uh, you, we don't need uh, the other part. And call big F uh, instead the cumulative distribution function of uh, the law, okay? We need uh, these two things uh, to state our theorem. So if alpha is uh, large, so uh, is between one half and one, 
you know that the correct rate, uh, at least from the bobkov ledoux uh, computation, is uh, uh, square root of n. So if you divide by square root of n your uh, random cost, well, we can give a convergence in low. Actually, this also gives a convergence of uh, the expectation of this quantity here, okay? But we can precisely characterize the limit. And the limit is described, as I told you, in terms of a Brownian bridge, Bt, that you need also to precompose with the f, with the commutative distribution function. So it's a sort of time-changed uh, Brownian bridge. And, uh, but we have also an interesting object, which is the so-called Kantorovich, uh, um, so should be the vast extent distance with respect to the Brownian bridge. So we need uh, some young integration now to give sense of this limit. I will tell you in, uh, in the next slide about this. So for alpha larger than one alpha, we have this limit in low which is abstract, of course, it's not a PD, but uh, we can say that the limit exists. While for alpha smaller than one half, you need to divide by the different rate, and you get almost sure convergence towards this, this quantity, which is uh, some constant, which depends only on alpha, but we are not able to compute, unfortunately. It's a, an abstract constant uh, between zero and plus infinity. We know it is finite and strictly positive, and then we have the integral of the absolutely continuous part to the power y minus alpha over the, actually this is over the interval AB, okay? Uh, what happens uh, when alpha equals one half? Uh, we don't know for the moment, okay? We have upper and lower bounds, but we don't know if uh, there is convergence in low or convergence or mature uh, if you renormalize, okay? Now, what is uh, our, uh, so let's focus on the alpha larger than one half, okay? So we have this new notion of uh, optimal transport, uh, which we call kantorovich young uh, problem. Why? Because uh, essentially what we are going to do is to define a sort of uh, norm, uh, which is a sort of negative uh, Sobolev norm, if you want, uh, of a G in this way. Essentially, we take the dual formulation of optimal transport, uh, the supremum over F of the integral of F in DG, uh, where F has a bounded uh, um, uh, holder constant with exponent alpha and is bounded by one. Well, uh, but of course it doesn't make sense, uh, apparently, right? If G is uh, uh, too irregular, like for example, it has finite Q variation, mm, this integral uh, is difficult to define, right? Of course you could say I integrate by parts, uh, maybe I, I put G here and F uh, like uh, over the differential, but also F is not so smooth, uh, so essentially you have a problem here to make sense of this expression. Anyway, using uh, the Young uh, theory, we can give sense to this quantity as long as G has finite Q variation. I'll tell you what it is. And alpha is uh, large enough. Essentially, alpha plus one over Q must be larger than one. Now, what is nice is that, for example, if G has bounded variation, if, if G is a function of bounded variation, it will be the difference between two measures. I mean, actually, the, the derivative will be the difference between two positive measures. You can recover essentially the, the, Wasserstein, uh, the, the classical uh, Wasserstein distance. But of course, you can also study this problem on its own. We can est establish uh, some basic properties, but some other properties we just uh, didn't search for the uh, proofs and so on. So there are plenty of open questions about this quantity here. Now, what happens if you, if you replace G, which uh, if you want in this part here, can be any function, deterministic function with finite Q variation. Now, if you take G to be the Brownian bridge, uh, as I told you, the Brownian bridge is a sort of Brownian motion, so you don't expect, uh, it's, you can prove it, it has no uh, finite variation, but it has finite Q variation if uh, Q is strictly larger than two. Be careful here because uh, this is the Q variation of uh, analysis and not of probability, so because maybe people in stochastic analysis will say, but uh, Brownian bridge, uh, Brownian motion has a, has a finite quadratic variation, but this is a, a slightly different concept uh, I show you in a, in a minute. Anyway, for Q strictly larger than two, we can plug uh, G to be the Brownian bridge. And so what is alpha? Well, if Q is uh, larger than two, we have room only for alpha, which is larger than one half. So essentially, we can give a meaning to this problem when G is Brownian motion, uh, Brownian bridge, only if alpha is larger than one half. And this is why for alpha, if you want, uh, for alpha equals to one half, we have this sort of phase transition. This is a point of view on this uh, transition at alpha equals one half. 
Now let's, mm, let's give a bit more of detail, but not too much on this uh, uh, Kantorovich young problem. So as I told you, we have a notion of a holder uh, semi-norm, but there's also a notion of p-variation, semi-norm, okay? These are all semi-norms because we're looking at the difference of the functions uh, between points. Now, uh, if you take any p larger than one, you can define this uh, p-variation by taking the supremum over all the partitions of the interval. Here we are on, on say, on the, on a finite interval. You do the partition, but instead of doing the sum of the increments, you take the small l p norm of the increments, right? So if p equals to one, uh, you get the classical total variation. If, if p is larger, you are uh, measuring things in a different, uh, in a different uh, uh, scale. So for alpha between zero and one, you can also prove a, a simple bound between the one over alpha variation semi-norm with respect to the C alpha holder, holder uh, semi-norm, okay? So you have a, a simple, uh, this is very simple to, to bound. But of course, as I told you, uh, one variation is what is called the total variation, but the quadratic variation in the probabilistic uh, stochastic analysis uh, setting is not uh, the true variation, okay? You should be careful with this. Anyway, uh, as I told you, functions of bounded one, one variation, yeah, yeah. In probability, because you know already the quadratic variation, or no? No, in, quadrat in probability you do the limit in probability for a fixed uh, family of, uh, of partitions. While if you do the supremum over all the possible partitions, uh, you get plus infinity for Brownian motion, but mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but forget about quadratic variation and just uh, stick to this. This uh, is... Uh, the correct notion for us. Now, it would be very nice to understand if, if you know, for alpha equals one alpha, we have this, this gap, this strange uh, rate. It would be nice perhaps to use quadratic variation instead of uh, true variation and uh, understand what happens in that case. But for the moment, we are, st we are stuck with this notion of uh, p variation. Okay, uh, so, and uh, what is Young integration? Essentially, Young integral is a way to define uh, the riemann stilges integral, uh, which is uh, integral of f uh, dg, which will be integral of f uh, g prime uh, if, uh, if g is differentiable, right? With, uh, but you know that you can give a meaning to this integral if uh, f is continuous, for example, and g has a finite one variation. This is sometimes called uh, the riemann stilges integral. Now, what Young already, say, 90, 90 years ago, <laughs> circa, proved was that you can relax uh, this condition by, by putting a bit of derivative on, uh, on f and removing a bit of derivative on g. Essentially, you have uh, this, uh, this range here. If you take p and q larger than 1, uh, such that 1 over q plus 1 over q is strictly larger than 1, and uh, you can prove that the integral in the sense of the limit of Riemann sums uh, uh, over any finite uh, uh, partition of the interval exists for f and g, which uh, have no common discontinuity points. This is a tricky part. And also you require that both p variation of f and q variation of g are finite. And actually you have, uh, you have a bound, you have an analytical bound of this. Now there is a tricky part, which is the no common discontinuity points, because in our case uh, we, we really need uh, G to be the approximations of uh, the Brownian bridge uh, given by the red and blue points. And so they will have discontinuity points. But on the other side, F will be very smooth because it will be C alpha, so no problem on that side. So essentially, we use as a, as a given result this one, which is, uh, say, the starting point of rough path theory. There's a lot of uh, developments since uh, 90 years ago on this. But now we use it in a simple way. So if F is a C alpha, and g as a finite q variation with this condition. And uh, of course, g will be our Brownian bridge. So uh, at, uh, at the extreme uh, will be 0. So this, this increment will not appear. Okay, you just have uh, an upper bound of this uh, shape here. So we have a, a good way to define uh, these quantities here, but also to maximize. Because essentially, now we have a bound given by this theory, which tells us essentially that we can give a definition of this Kantorovich Young norm, which is the supremum over all the possible f, which have all their semi norm bounded by one, of the Young integral of f in the g, provided that g has a q variation uh, finite and alpha plus one over q is uh, larger than one. So this is a well defined quantity, and uh, you have a bound. You also have stability with respect to convergence in q variation, 
so it's a continuous uh, quantity, and extends, you can check the Kantorovich uh, uh, distance uh, when G has, has a bounded variation, okay? So this is a good notion that, that makes sense, but of course uh, you lost uh, somehow the, the, the notion of coupling. So where is, uh, who is this pi here? Uh, no, we just worked uh, with the dual formulation to give a, a definition. Actually, we can recover by taking the dual of the dual, which uh, should be the same as the primal problem. So what we do is to construct uh, this notion of coupling with finite energy. Essentially, we, we add a condition, so we, we need to replace a bit uh, here the condition. In the classical case, uh, you have both uh, mu and nu. Right now, g is the difference uh, between uh, mu and nu, okay? So actually, it's the integral of the difference between mu and nu. So we need to uh, replace, uh, remove these conditions which uh, use mu and nu separately. Because if a function has finite p variation or q variation, you cannot split it as a, as a positive increment and uh, negative increment. So we need to remove this. And how do we remove it? Well, we require, uh, first of all, uh, yes, to, to have some, a bit of control on the diagonal of the coupling. Okay? We require that the integral of t minus s to the power alpha with respect to this coupling, which is still a measure, okay? is finite, positive measure it is, but uh, we require uh, this quantity to be finite. And uh, now for every f, which is C alpha, essentially we test the coupling uh, with, uh, with uh, f. You can give a meaning to this quantity here, and uh, this must be equal to the integral of f in the g, okay? Now if your coupling, if your g has finite uh, uh, variation, and you can represent it as a difference of the mu and nu, you will recover essentially the classical notion of coupling. Okay, so uh, in our primal problem, now we, we have this uh, set of couplings and we want to minimize uh, the energy, which is this integral here, which is, should be the transport cost. And then without surprise, you can show that these are the same. Okay, so one could start uh, directly from the primal and then uh, uh, understand the dual, but uh, this is the way we essentially work it out. So it seems to be more natural. So you can get uh, both the Young uh, integral formulation, but also this optimal transport formulation of the problem. So, what is this x? I think this is. Uh, oh no, it's uh, sorry, it's uh, i times i. Sorry, no, it's me. I, I is the interval where we work. Okay, and of course, but if you start uh, from the from the primal problem, so from this uh, transport uh, formulation, you should prove that uh, this set of couplings is non-empty. So what we found interesting, though I don't give you the details, is that actually uh, you can reinterpret uh, the Young uh, integral construction as a way to construct a coupling, okay? So essentially, in the classical uh, optimal transport, uh, there's a trivial way to build a coupling, which is you take the product measure of mu and nu. But if you don't have separately mu and nu, uh, how can you build a, a coupling? Well, Young integral, uh, Young's integral is a way if you want to provide a coupling. It's not optimal in general, but uh, the, his construction provides a coupling, which is an interesting fact. Okay, so now, without uh, too much uh, surprise, maybe for, for you, because as I told you, we built exactly this notion of uh, kantorovich young problem to get continuity. Now we can plug it in uh, in our random uh, uh, matching, uh, random assignment problem. So what we do, we take uh, our red and blue points, which are now random, you define uh, the uh, cumulative distribution uh, function of the red points and the cumulative distribution function of the blue points. Okay, these are two functions which, uh, as long as n is finite, have bounded variation. But uh, when uh, uh, n becomes infinite, uh, okay, uh, actually their difference uh, will have, will converge to something. Now we're going to show you some simulations on this. But what we know is that as long as n is finite, we can we have these three quantities which are the same. Okay, you have the combinatorial cost for the optimal assignment. Uh, yes, then you have the Wasserstein distance of order alpha between the empirical measures. And then our kantorovich young uh, uh, semi-norm of the difference of F and F tilde times N, okay, because we work, uh, uh, we, because we like to work with the cumulative distribution functions of, uh, of probability measures. But this is just a scaling factor because we put it one over N here. And now what we know is that uh, as N grows, uh, well, the two cumulative distribution functions, uh, 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 no, we need to take the difference between the two cumulative distribution functions uh, and they will behave like a random walk. But actually not right, like a random walk because of course uh, the number of blue points and red points, uh, so if you sum uh, up and down, 
if you find a red point or blue point. At the end, the number is the same. So essentially, you are taking a random walk and conditioning to, to be zero at time one, at the final extreme of the, of the interval. And this is why you get a Brownian bridge, essentially. right? If you increase the number of points uh, and you make the intervals, uh, the jumps a bit shorter, like one over square root of n, you get something which is like a Brownian motion, but conditioned at time one. Okay, So you get a Brownian bridge. Actually, this is already known. Uh, and there are quantitative rates uh, also in Q variation. Okay, So we get, uh, for free from the literature, that we get uh, a very uh, nice convergence of these uh, scaled random walks uh, uh, towards a Brownian bridge. And of course, uh, if you plug these bounds uh, together with our notion of uh, Wasserstein, uh, uh, sorry, Kantorovich Young semi norm, uh, you get the convergence. Okay, uh, okay. we found a, a reasonable limit uh, notion for the problem, and uh, we get stability essentially by construction. Now, of course, uh, this doesn't prove everything. Uh, for example, uh, our proof uh, here for alpha larger than one alpha works only if you have bounded support. But I think it's more technical because <laughs> you should extend a bit uh, these theories uh, to unbounded, uh, unbounded intervals. Uh, for example, you need to extend the Kantorovich, uh, um, this notion of Kantorovich young semi norm to unbounded uh, uh, intervals, but also the convergence to the Brownian bridge. I haven't found it on the literature on the unbounded. Uh, interval okay so maybe some some work uh, technical work should be done here to cover for example a gaussian uh, distribution of points uh, you will have some points very far from the the origin and also as i told you the, the main uh, open question is about uh, the case alpha equals one alpha so if you have some uh, good knowledge i think uh, working with quadratic variation should tell something but it's not clear to me uh, but of course what we can prove uh, is that uh, uh, using the PD argument, uh, you can get this bound here. You can get, uh, the, uh, if you take the expectation with alpha equal one half of the matching uh, cost, and you divide by square root of n log n, so the square root uh, is also covering log n. This is finite, and uh, under mild conditions of the distribution of the points. Uh, but assume, for example, that the points uh, are uh, uniformly distributed on an interval. What we proved uh, with Michael is uh, actually a student of, of mine. Uh, it was in, the, in, this, uh, in this bachelor thesis. But it's a very simple argument. You can prove, uh, you can prove uh, also a companion lower bound. You can show that the limit of this expectation divided by square root of log n log n is strictly positive. But we don't know at present if the limit exists. OK, this true lim soup and limit may be different. I don't believe so, but it's difficult to prove. OK, so if you have some uh, good ideas uh, on this, it uh, would be very interesting. Um, another interesting thing is that uh, we worked uh, with, the, with, the, with the matching problem, which is very much connected uh, to the optimal transport problem. But some of these techniques uh, extend uh, also to other combinatorial problems, like the traveling salesperson problem, where you have uh, red and blue points, uh, and there's a single, for example, is a taxi driver that needs to take uh, all these workers uh, to the jobs, uh, right? Uh, you, you, you can pick up uh, one person. Uh, there is a COVID, so you can only take one. And you bring it to the job, and then you uh, go take another one, and so on. So, right? so in this case, uh, you are looking at the most efficient way for the driver to take all these, all these people to their jobs. Okay? So and this uh, we can cover. So you get similar uh, up and lower bounds, also limit results. Uh, and, but, uh, other problems, for example, there's a so-called k-factor problem, um, which we not, not clear to me if they are covered or not. But anyway, I would stress, uh, I mean, this is the most uh, interesting question for me at the moment. OK, thanks a lot, uh, and uh, thank you. Okay.